Hello friends, my name is JJ, and for those of you who are not yet my friends, I am a guy who spends a lot of time thinking and talking about issues of culture and how various different types of people build identities for themselves. I particularly like to engage with these sorts of topics using my own country of Canada as a case study. This is because when it comes to the always relevant issue of national identity, Canada is a good example of a place where the patriotic culture tends to be bound up in a lot of insecurities stemming from the arbitrary and political nature of the country. I mean, look, we have this giant continent inhabited by a bunch of people who mostly share many of the big traditional metrics of culture, like history, language, religion, family traditions, and so on. But that continental civilization is also carelessly cleaved into two different countries for reasons that trace back to an 18th century dispute among colonial elites that a lot of ordinary people on both sides considered overrated even then. As the writer Douglas Copeland once put it, If you were from outer space and were shown a topographic map of North America and then told to come up with the stupidest way possible to slice it up, you'd probably say, let's put a straight line right across the middle which totally ignores all ecosystems, biospheres, and geological formations. That way we can permanently warp and cripple the citizens on both sides of the border. And yet this is exactly what happened, but not in such a conscious and deliberately playful manner. But anyway, the way things played out is that this half, the United States of America wound up being the mightiest, most important country in the history of the world, while this half, Canada, not so much. And one fairly predictable thing that happened in the aftermath of all of this was the creation on the Canadian side of a myth of cultural superiority. Basically, oftentimes when two very similar societies split, the weaker half will assert that it possesses certain strengths of character that compensate for the lack of more traditional metrics of strength. The US South adopted this attitude towards the North after the Civil War, for instance. Ireland has this attitude towards the UK. Belgians feel this way about the Dutch, Pakistanis about India, and so on. And so too do the Canadians feel about America. Which brings us to King of the Hill episode 18 of the show's 13th and final season, an episode known as Uh-Oh Canada, which aired on May 17th 2009. It is a satirical parable on Canadian-American relations as understood through this prism of a culture clash born from national insecurities. So let us watch this episode together and discuss some of the themes it explores. And along the way, I will also explain all of the Canadian references to you. So basically, the setup is that it's summer in Arlen, and the gang is looking forward to hanging out. But then Boomhauer has some disappointing news. <sighs> This will no doubt be the best summer of our entire lives. Yep. Yep. Well, I tell you what, man, I'd love to just chill back and then get a dang old grill and chill, man, but I've got to head up Canada this summer, man. Canada? A man only has so many summers, Boomhauer. Why would you waste yours in a country that's dismantling its navy? One running gag I really like on King of the Hill is when Hank gets offended by some very idiosyncratic thing. This idea that Canada is dismantling its navy, as far as I know, that's not actually a specific reference to anything in particular. But there is, of course, this long-running idea that Canada is sort of not pulling its weight in terms of its uh, military, you know, chronically sort of underfunding its armed forces and this sort of thing. Tell me them down house swap with no Canadian family for, you know, eh? House swap? There's gonna be Canadians living here, walking around, touching things for three whole months? You're gonna be gone for an absurd amount of time! <laughs> <laughs> Miss him! <laughs> Miss him! Look, I know we all miss Boomhauer, but he wouldn't want us crying in our beer. Hey, looks like the Canadians are here. Boo! Now be polite, Dale. We're Americans. We're the world's welcome mat. It doesn't matter if they're from Canada, Laos, or God forbid, California. Right now, they're from Rainy Street. It's our patriotic duty to show them what good neighbors are all about. This sort of sets up one of the kind of interesting subversions of this episode, which is that the common stereotype of Canadians is, of course, that they are very polite and, you know, conciliatory and, uh, you know, welcoming and open-minded and this sort of thing. But as we shall see, uh, that is not actually the case with these particular Canadians. And I like this subversion because it reminds us that Americans kind of have their own mythology or in their own sort of hospitable nature. 
and sort of the tension that Hank feels in this episode between his sort of obligation as an American and sort of an idea of what an American is supposed to be on a sort of cultural level sort of comes into conflict with, uh, with the behavior of the Canadians. Holy jeez! This looks like one of those spicy motels. Well, we wanted something different than the lake this year. I think we got her. <laughs> I can immediately tell that this family is supposed to be from Ontario because of the way that the father says the lake. This is a sort of very stereotypical type of holiday that people from Ontario like to go on. You know, renting out a cottage by one of Ontario's many, many lakes. I remember when I was briefly living in Ontario hearing people talking about going to the lake for the summer it was such a common thing. Oh dear, I'm just gonna slip this young lady behind the Chesterfield. The mother calls the uh, the couch the Chesterfield, which is another very Ontario sort of signifier. My father is from Ontario, and he always called the uh, the couch the Chesterfield when I was growing up. Chesterfield was, I think, at one time a brand of couch, and that's where that comes from. This is a word that you are very likely to see in any purported list of Canadian slang. Hello, and welcome to the United States. Peggy Hill, at your service. Hank Hill, good to meet you. Gordon Huskins, it's a pleasure. Oh, sorry. This is my wife Maureen and our son Ali. One of my favorite things whenever Canadians are depicted in pop culture is to see what names they're given. They're often given these like very stereotypically like square white people names. In this case, the couple is Gordon and Maureen. I think the father in that episode of The Simpsons we talked about a few weeks ago was also named Gord. How tall are you? Four foot eleven. Oh, right on. That's 150 centimeters. Hey, I sound tall in Canada. I wonder if I'm thinner there too. So there's two things here. One thing is that the kid's shirt says Prutes on it, which I believe is supposed to be a satire of the Roots Company, which is a popular clothing chain in Canada. But the second thing is that the kid thinks of Bobby's height in terms of the metric system, which is just incorrect. I actually made a whole video about this very topic, which is Canada's sort of half-hearted embrace of the metric system. And one of the things that I talked about in that is that Canadians are not, in fact, super fluent with the metric system and certainly do not use the metric system in reference to their own bodies. So describing yourself as being four foot eleven or whatever, like that is exactly exactly what Canadians would do. Same with your weight, which would be measured in pounds. The metric system in Canada is generally only used for less personal things, like stuff that the government regulates in some way, like highway signs and packaged foods. But you can just watch the full video if you want to learn more about that. That's a good looking t-shirt you got there, Gordon. You in the mower business? Oh, I wish, but I've got a thing for McCollum mowers. Canadian outfit, ride high, ride strong, ride McCollum. Now that's a slogan. So this is just a made-up company, McCollum Mowers. No such actual thing in Canada. It's a good name for a satirical Canadian company though, McCollum. I notice that this is another sort of very stereotypical thing when we talk about sort of cliched Canadian names. There are a lot of people of Scottish heritage in Canada, which has led to last names beginning with MC being a very sort of stereotypical thing. Of course, I wouldn't know anything about that. This is for you. And join me, won't you, on a 50-state tour of America. Here's Texas barbecue sauce, Washington apples, Vermont maple syrup. Oh, that's so nice. But we always travel with our own pure maple syrup. It's like they say, you don't want to drink the water in every country, eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I always find this to be an interesting reminder of just how culturally similar Canada and the US are. You have something like maple syrup, which we often think of as being this very iconic Canadian thing, and yet there are several maple syrup producing states in America as well, including states like Vermont that have made it very much their iconic thing as well. So you see, I predicted correctly. The family is apparently from Guelph, Ontario. Hello, my name is Suzette. I live next door. Yeah, man, I'm down bonjour, man. Here, I brought you some coffee crisp, huh? All right, so Boomhauer is living in Guelph, where the family is from, and the next door neighbor is, uh, is a French Canadian. I know that in like standard depictions of Canada in pop culture, you always have to sort of like include a French Canadian person at some point because you know, it's one of the sort of things about Canada that everybody knows. But you know, Ontario does not actually have a lot of French speaking people. As anybody who watches this channel on the regs, of course, already well knows, French Canadians are very much concentrated in the province of Quebec 
And it is the unequal distribution of French Canadians across Canada that is very much one of sort of the defining cultural characteristics of the country in reality, as opposed to sort of the country of popular mythology. Also, if I may be very nitpicky for a moment, the woman gives Boomhauer a plate of coffee crisp, which is indeed a sort of traditional Canadian snack, but they don't look like that at all in real life. Coffee crisp is actually a type of Canadian candy bar. Um, I can actually just go buy one. Hold on a sec, I'll go to the corner store. All right, so this is Coffee Crisp. You can see it's just a standard candy bar type thing. It's like a chocolate covered wafer. Glad I've been working out. And it's filled with some sort of artificial flavoring that gives it that kind of bitter taste that coffee has. I don't really like coffee, so I don't really like Coffee Crisp, but it is definitely one of the uh, very sort of iconic Canadian candy bars. It's weird to me that they could have been aware that Coffee Crisp exists and yet also be oblivious to how it looks. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Maureen made a nice tray of her brownies, eh? So what do you say? Let's get at her. Well, thanks, Gordon. You can see that Gord is wearing a Roots shirt as well. This is the kind of clothing that the Roots company makes. They just make like very sort of basic like t-shirts and hoodies and things, always with the logo splashed across. Hey, uh, we're gonna watch Super Bowl 13 later. The Broncos Orange Crush versus the Cowboys Doomsday Defense. Wanna pull up a chair? Oh, thanks, but you know, I prefer the fast-paced Canadian three-down system. I mean, American football is a real snoozer, huh? <laughs> Enjoy your nap though, eh? <laughs> so this is a good example of the Canadians sort of being self-righteous about a very sort of trivial difference between the two countries. There are some very small differences between Canadian football and American football, such as the fact that Canadian football only has three downs. But this is a very sort of ridiculous thing to sort of focus on because of course the sport is ultimately this very particularly North American thing that Europeans and the rest of the world know nothing about. You know, and I don't really think that there's even that many Canadians who would sort of get on their high horse about this distinction in particular. You, most Canadians who like Canadian football would also like, you know, NFL football because, yeah, it is basically the same sport. And now to commemorate our first draft beer of the summer, I present to you your very own personalized frosty beer mugs. Uh, wow. Gordon, I'd be honored if you used Boomhauer's. Cheers, everybody. Well, I guess it's a fine beer. You know, if you're not into flavor, but you love going to the washroom all night. <laughs> oh, sorry. Maureen's given me our secret signal to leave. Good to meet all you. So that is, I think, a much more sort of realistic uh, thing that Canadians are often sort of irrationally proud of. A lot of Canadians do have this kind of mythology about Canadian beer versus American beer, and of course Canadian beer being so much superior in one way or another. Some of this has to do with urban legends about the alcohol content in Canadian versus American beer, which I discussed in a whole other video. I can't believe Gordon called the cops on us. He's gonna be sorry when he sees me today. It's about time you woke up, Hank. Anger is more fun when shared. Mom, can I have another half liter of OJ, please? What? Bobby, we speak English in this house. So a half liter of OJ, that is a more sort of realistic way in which a Canadian would use uh, the metric system. Because like I said earlier, the metric system is used in food packaging in Canada. Hey there, Hank. Can I make you up a Ryan Ginger? Nothing says summer like an RNG. Ryan Ginger, that's another very good sort of stereotypical Canadian treat. Probably the two most sort of uh, iconic Canadian drinks would be uh, rye, whiskey, and then ginger ale. So of course combining them would be the most Canadian thing of all. Ah, that Gordon Huskins. All he talks about is how great Canada is and what's wrong with America. I dodged bullets in the killing fields for two extra years instead of going to Canada. <laughs> that's a, uh, I like that joke. There is a kind of thinking 
among some immigrant communities, and I've actually heard immigrants in America say this, that sort of the Canadian immigration system is sort of much more open, much more generous, you know, it's easier to move to Canada than it is to move to America. But America is also the more desired country, you know, more people over in the world want to move to America, you know, the numbers bear this out. So sort of the snobbishness comes in when it's kind of like, well, are you willing to struggle to get into America, or are you willing to settle for Canada? <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, newspaper is called the Provincial Times with big Union Jack on it. It's not an actual newspaper, but it, it is believable as the name of one. All right, you turkeys. I got a two for a slewbex. You want to throw down? Let's throw down. Have a seat. A two four of Slubax. So Slubax is not a real Canadian beer company, although the design of it certainly looks very Canadian. Looks a lot like uh, Moosehead. I think that's a. I'm not a drinker, but uh, yeah, Moosehead Lager. Kind of the design seems based on that. And two four is a kind of Ontario slang for a box of beer. Ah, now this is a beer. Why can't America make a decent ale? Probably because we're too busy making medical breakthroughs and blockbuster movies and going to the moon. Yeah, well we invented zippers, penicillin, and the Zamboni. So those are good examples of the Canadian inventions that we're all supposed to remember and be very proud of in this country. Although what is particularly interesting about this, and I don't know if this was done on purpose or if this is just an oversight, is that Gord repeats what is a very common Canadian urban legend, which is that we invented penicillin. Canada actually had nothing to do with the invention of penicillin, but a lot of Canadians believe we did for some reason. I think this is because uh, a Canadian was involved in the development of insulin, and I think a lot of people get insulin and penicillin mixed up, even though of course they're two very different drugs. I guess they kind of sound the same. But if it was intentional, that's a nice touch, because believing that is very consistent with the sort of person Gord is. I love Canada's national anthem. Too bad they don't play it much at the Olympics. And your money has a girl on it. The Canadian money does indeed have a girl on it. Queen Elizabeth. You Americans, you're so gosh darn ignorant and self-centered. Tell me who our prime minister is. Why? <laughs> I like that a lot. We'll talk about this later on, but like at one time, that was, for some reason, like something that Canadians were very sort of fixated on as a sort of source of pride and sort of smugness over America. This idea that Americans did not know who the Prime Minister of Canada was and that this was like some sort of very big moral failing on their part. That's why it's kind of funny that Hank is just like, why? Because like, why should he know that? Like, who cares? Whereas like from the Canadian perspective, it's like, how could you not know that? We're right next door. This is such important knowledge because it's about Canada. So the two men attempt to settle their feud by having a riding mower contest, but since they're both drunk, they just wind up getting arrested instead. Hank's boss bails him out, but Gord is left to fend for himself. Meanwhile... Vous nous pouvez me partir, mon cher. Chérie, non nous pas. Nous avons encore cette nuit. Fais l'amour à moi. You know, I am not fluent in French, so I cannot uh, give any sort of commentary on this. But my suspicion is that uh, that was not very good French, and uh, whatever French was being spoken was not being spoken with a sort of French-Canadian accent. My uh, French fluent uh, viewers can give me their own analysis of that scene. Boom hour! There he is! Oh, hey there! Hello, Jeff. Oh my, it's the 15th already? Would you mind if we stayed a little longer? Uh, Gordon's in a bit of a legal spot. Suzette? What are you doing here? What about John Paul? John Paul? I hope he's staying in that aluminium mine forever, huh? I finished with that guy. C'est ça, c'est tout. That's it, that's all. The idea of a French-Canadian man working in an aluminium mine, that's a sort of very funny kind of old-fashioned thing. Canada has a huge mining industry. Almost any valuable metal you can imagine is mined somewhere in Canada. In fact, long-time viewers may notice that I have this poster here in the background. This is actually a poster of the different metals that are mined in different parts of Canada. But I actually think that aluminium is one of the metals that is not mined in Canada in any large quantities. 
Yeah, it's not even on the map. Aluminium comes from like Jamaica and I think like East Africa. If you come from an aluminium producing country, let me know in the comments below. So anyway, the Hills decide to be the bigger people and agree to let the Canadians stay with them. And then they eventually pawn their kegerator in order to pay for Gord's bail. You know, Canadians might be sanctimonious and bland, but America has been protecting Canada ever since England stopped. That's a very fair observation on Hank's part, and frankly, something that I wish that sort of more Canadians would keep in mind. See you guys! If you're ever up in Canada to get reasonably priced pharmaceuticals or, you know, a breath of fresh air, <laughs> look us up! Reasonably priced pharmaceuticals is, of course, a reference to the fact that prescription drugs are quite a bit cheaper in Canada than the US. The reasons why are multifaceted, but this has resulted in a phenomenon of so-called drug tourism, where Americans will cross the border in order to get cheaper medicine than they can find back home. The nerve of that guy! So ungrateful. Didn't even say thank you for getting him out of jail. No, he didn't, but you know what? We were good neighbors and we did the right thing. That's what matters. So, strictly as a piece of television, I don't know if this was that great of an episode, a common criticism of the final years of King of the Hill is that a lot of plots began to rely on this very formulaic structure in which some unusual group of people from some distinctive subculture came to town and provoke a bit of a culture clash with the Hills. And sometimes both sides wind up learning a lesson, but just as often people from the subculture just wind up being unredeemable weirdos and Hank and his family come out looking morally superior. This is why King of the Hill is often considered a pretty conservative show, since the lesson taught by a lot of episodes often seems to just boil down to don't be different. Or as the Dutch say, just be normal, that's crazy enough. As a work documenting Canada-US relations, however, I think this episode is a bit more valuable. A lot of depictions of Canada in American pop culture tend to fit in one of two categories. The first is something that is just heavily stereotypical in a kind of playful, silly way, poking fun at the small, distinctive quirks of Canada that Americans tend to find interesting. Something like this from 30 Rock. This is unbelievable. <sighs> I haven't done any real acting since I was in that high school football movie back in Ottawa. You're Canadian? All right, hosers, I want all 12 of us fighting for every meter on all three downs. And we're gonna make this a boxing day the Prime Minister will never forget. And then the other way is to depict Canada in this very flattering manner, a country that's portrayed as a better version of America, where the people are nicer and the social programs are more generous and so on. The Simpsons did an episode set in Canada recently that was based around this premise, and I did a whole other video about that. But this episode of King of the Hill is one of the very few times I can remember seeing a depiction of Canada in the American media that actually tries to engage with a more culturally complex dimension of the Canadian identity, which is the insecurity inherent in being Canadian and how it can manifest as a snobbish anti-Americanism. I have definitely known a lot of people like Gord and Maureen over the years, and although they are obviously exaggerated to some degree, I can also see how watching them would be uncomfortable for some Canadians, just because they depict an unflattering side of Canada that I think a lot of Canadians are in a bit of denial about. Both Canadian and American culture tends to flatter Canadians with endless praise about how polite and courteous we are. And I think that this flattery, combined with the constant need to feel morally superior to Americans, can result in a very unattractive personality that I think this episode does a pretty good job of depicting. But on the other hand, however, I would also say that this episode feels a little dated now in its critique. With any work, you always have to think about when it was made and in what social political context. As I said earlier, this episode was part of King of the Hill's 2008-2009 season, which means it was probably made sometime in 2007. And the mid-2000s were a time in which Canadian self-righteousness was at a real peak. 9-11 and the Iraq War, I'm sad to say, brought out a lot of snobbishness in a certain segment of middle-class Canada who enjoyed viewing America's troubles with Middle Eastern terrorism as a kind of humbling payback for America's irresponsible use of global power. And the Prime Minister of Canada in those days, Jean Chrétien, 
was also a man who built a lot of his political success around constantly comparing and contrasting Canada to the US, assuring middle class voters that leaders like him were the only thing keeping Canada from being like the America of George W. Bush, which was portrayed as this terrible place where no one had healthcare and there were constant gun massacres and all this. And I think that this sort of smug and unfair rhetoric didn't go unnoticed in America. And Gord and Maureen really remind me of like, the quintessentially obnoxious middle-class Canadian boomer culture from this particular period of North American history. Today, however, I feel like Canadian culture has actually changed a fair bit for the better over the last 15 years. There are plenty of reasons to dislike Justin Trudeau, for instance, but I don't think he leans into anti-American chauvinism to nearly the same degree that Prime Minister Kretchen did. And in the absence of a big divergent issue like the war on terror to turn the two countries against each other, I think that there has been increasingly a lot more focus on the political struggles that both Canada and the US have in common, like inequality or racism. I also think that Canadians of my generation, and particularly the generation younger than me, live lives that have been very defined by the internet age, wherein cross-border interactions and friendships between Canadians and Americans have never been easier or more common. And as these human-to-human -human bonds continue to deepen, it becomes that much harder for Canadians to stereotype or demonize Americans in the way that I think was quite common for Gord and Maureen's generation. So in short, when I watch this episode, I'm reminded of many things that I dislike about Canadian culture, but I also find it weirdly encouraging in that it can also be a reminder of how far we've come. So anyway, if you have any other depictions of Canada in pop culture you would like to see me review, let me know in the comments and I will see you next week. Terrible.